Hello viewers, welcome to MOOC's online course on Visual Perception and Art, a Survey Across the Cultures. This is the 12th lecture in this course and today we shall be looking at not any particular tradition or culture, but two particular art terms called mimetic and non-mimetic across the globe of course. Now, mimetic and non-mimetic are two terms that uh, refer to two different kinds of visualization. Generally speaking, mimetic art is that kind of art, be it painting or sculpture, where the reference to the real world is very strong. I mean all arts, generally speaking, unless it is a purely abstract painting, the reference to the real world, the reference to the natural world is usually there. It is just a matter of degree that in some cases the reference is very strong and in certain cases the reference is not so strong, but the reference is always there. So the difference between mimetic art and non-mimetic art is at one level a matter of degree that in certain mimetic paintings in certain kinds of paintings which are which come under the category of mimetic art you find the reference to the natural world is very strong and in works of art coming under the category of non-mimetic art the reference to the real world is less but that is only one aspect and that does not really explain this uh, two uh, terms or categories properly because in mimetic art it is not just a matter of reference that makes a mimetic art a mimetic art because the reference to the real world is there in both the cases both mimetic and non mimetic. So what uh, discriminates mimetic art from non mimetic art is not merely the reference but actually the approach of visualization, I mean the visual technique or method that you are applying. For example, in mimetic art, the artist generally applies a certain technique or visual language which uh, kind of enables him to follow nature as faithfully as possible. I mean we are talking about a kind of realistic kind of painting or a realism where the whole intention of the artist is to capture the real life or capture in terms of a real life as faithfully, as closely as possible. Whereas in non-mimetic art across the world, the this whole idea of being faithful to nature in terms of its visual appearance in painting and sculpture is simply not there as a serious concern. In non-mimetic art, they are more concerned with creating a parallel visual world, a parallel pictorial world and that uh, distinguishes non-mimetic art from mimetic art. Now, mimetic art involves a kind of visual perception which tries to follow and replicate the actual visual reality and it is such a tendency that you find that tendency even among the children. So children attempt to do this kind of mimetic uh, process uh, most of the times, though what they come up with may uh, not be so convincing in terms of a realistic portraiture or a realistic depiction, but the entire attempt of a child is generally to be as faithful as possible to the real world. And that is the reason, if you remember what we discussed when we were discussing child art, that what looks like almost an abstract shape or form in a child art to us is never an abstract or meaningless shape or form, 
uh, shape or form to the child himself. The child knows very well what he or she has drawn or painted. So, when you look at these drawings done by children, you know very well by following the trajectory of the lines, the process of the drawing that whether it is from imagination or from the real life, the method of drawing generally follows the life as directly as possible. In other words, children too desperately want to replicate the real world, albeit in a different language or mode. So, the idea of mimesis that art is supposed to be an imitation of life is there almost in every child, but the outcome is different. In real examples of mimetic art, when we look at and we will be looking at uh, just now examples from Roman painting, when we will be looking at examples from Greek sculpture or Renaissance painting, then you will know that mimesis or mimetic art has become a singular concern. So, in case of children then at the end of their process, you may also say that though they try to make a mimetic art, they try to mime or imitate the visual reality or the nature around, they end up with something that is not purely mimetic and it is true that they end up with something that is not purely mimetic due to several reasons. Either they lack the skill of making purely accurate and convincing mimetic art or they do not want to do that. But there is an element of mimesis within the process, inherent in the process itself. And a similar kind of mimesis can also be found in folk art, but to a lesser degree in many cases. Like this, this form resembles a fish also, but the tail uh, kind of transforms itself into a tree branch with lot of foliage, then the fins do not look very convincingly like fins and the body of the fish which is supposed to be full of scales here is full of decorations and designs. Really speaking, this particular example of folk art is not mimetic at all in any sense this any kind of resemblance of fish with the form that you see is only a very far stretched and a remote reference. As the painting itself suggests, there is no intention on part of the painter to make the form look like a fish, rather the intention is to make the fish or this creature look like a composite being which uh, is uh, which does not belong to any fixed category. It is neither fish nor tree nothing, but it is both. Now, when you come across this kind of examples of course, then you know that you are slowly moving away from mimetic art and you are entering into the world of non mimetic art. Now, look at this one. This is an example of a Bengal Potochitro or scroll painting from Bengal and the subject is the demolition of uh, World Trade Center when it was attacked on plane by Osama bin Laden way back many years back. Now, how this folk painter is trying to depict that, how he is drawing the aeroplanes, why his aeroplanes also have heads of uh, people or maybe they are beheaded people. I mean there are a lot of stories inside this painting of course, but I am talking about the visual configuration that this painter is trying to arrive at 
which uh, has a desperation to be as faithful as possible, but not visually, conceptually. Conceptually faithful to the event, to that tragic incident. And when a Potua from a similar tradition is painting a scene from a mythology, of course, that Potua or painter does not have any responsibility of uh, making his figures look as if they are from the real world. For example, this huge black figure is a mythological demon and he exercises all his freedom to be as non-mimetic as possible. So, non-mimesis also gives you an opportunity of freedom to imagine or build up an imagination may be based on a mythology, may be based on a given story, but it allows you to build up a visual imagination more strongly because you are free from any real life references and that is very important for non-mimetic art. Even in folk terracotta sculpture like this, the reference to a real animal is there because of the white pair of teeth, because of the trunk. You can make out that this is a figure of an elephant, but again the long neck refers to the horse. Maybe it is a composite creature having characteristic features of both the elephant and horse, we do not know. But the point is that up to a point the reference was there uh, very strongly in the mind of the uh, person, the artist who was making it, but then he left these references behind and he plunged into uh, wild imaginations. So, mimesis strictly speaking does not work in folk art. It also stops working in child art after a point. And in these cases, the reference uh, is there to a mother and a child, but it just stops there rest that is a visual form, the configuration, the look, the eyes, the posture, everything is a visual imagination rather a visual imitation. So, in other words, if you want to uh, identify mimetic art as visual imitation, then you can safely say that non-mimetic art is visual imagination. Now, this is not a very watertight compartment distinction because visual imitation may entail imagination and visual imagination also on certain occasions may enter visual imitations. But predominantly mimetic art is based on an imitative visual language whereas non-mimetic art like this one is based on an imaginative or imaginary pictorial language. Beside folk art, in the entire tradition of Indian miniature painting also, the visual language that is employed is fundamentally based on non-mimetic art language or non-mimetic art idiom, where the, where there is no compulsion on part of the painter to be very faithful to nature or life in terms of rendering objects. So, one can use one's imagination like exaggeration, distortion, extension of limbs and features without bothering about whether it is matching with the real life or not. Then of course, in this kind of paintings like this one, there are occasions when the painter has to paint a dragon or a mythical animal and then there is no question of mimesis altogether, because there is no dragon in real life, whom are you to imitate? So, you imagine a dragon and this imagination is highly possible in this kind of non-mimetic art. And this kind of non-mimetic paintings like this one in the pre mughal paintings, you look at these paintings carefully, you also look at very early examples of Persian paintings like this one and this one.
and this one and I am sure by now you have been able to notice something you know what that is non mimetic art beside uh, allowing the artist to imagine visual forms in uh, most wildly it also allows the artists to play with the space. The space concept in these non mimetic paintings do not bother about the realistic space idea. It simply gets rid of this idea that the painted space has to be an extension of the real space. And in another category where we find whole lot of examples of non mimetic art is the decorative traditions across the world and of course, including India where it is completely non mimetic although the motifs may be derived from nature and life. For example, when you look at this design this kind of floor decoration you might uh, be able to figure out ok uh, this particular motif is derived from this flower this is from that plant. But then ultimately when you look at the design when you look at this huge floor decoration in front of a rural hut like this one what you see is a non mimetic decoration. Why non mimetic in spite of the fact that many of these motifs are derived from real life or real nature it is non mimetic because the ultimate intention was not to retain the character or the form or the shape of the real nature. The ultimate motive or objective of these artists was to transform these motives into a pattern. So, it leaves behind its original identity that you find in nature and assumes a new identity this is identity of a decorative form the identity of a pattern. So, if your intention is to turn a motif into pattern then of course, it uh, has to be non mimetic. Even in those folk paintings like this one Pithora wall painting of Gujarat where uh, many of these or rather most of these figures and objects and animals and human beings are clearly recognizable they are clearly identifiable yet the language is not at all mimetic it is very non mimetic. Why? Because the painter or the painters because this is a collectively painted composition on the wall they do not try at all they do not bother to try at all to convey this idea that all the figures painted here have a very convincing reality as you find them in real nature. Their intention is rather different to give you a sense of a world where all these motifs reside together a conceptual world a religious world a cultural space. Similarly, in this Madhubani painting by the famous painter Ganga Devi you find that though the subject matter is uh, pretty uh, not realistic of course, not even naturalistic, but pretty recognizable let us say it has a very obvious narrative content, but the style of painting the style of representation is very non mimetic it it it, it uh, um, kind of uh, adopts a style that is uh, independent and that is uh, self uh, referent it does not refer back to the life, but it refers back to the visual language itself. So, in order to understand this kind of paintings you need to read the visual language, but when you look at mimetic examples like this as opposed to non mimetic visual traditions mimetic uh, traditions are usually committed uh, to very strong reference and strong and very convincing rendering of visual forms and they are found in huge number in the western art history. But then in order to read these paintings in order to understand these paintings you have to of course, uh, give some time to the visual language, but then you also have to have a knowledge of the visual world. I mean how does actually a space um, uh, exist in the real world and how the painter makes it exist in this pictorial world. Hence, in mimetic tradition you find 
certain uh, principles of realistic art being employed which we shall discuss later for example, perspective the laws and principles of perspective then the laws of uh, gradually receding space gradually receding size or scale of human beings so on and so forth. Now, that creates a sense of space which almost looks like an extension of a real space. In non mimetic art nobody tries to create a space which might look like an extension of the real space. It is a different space altogether different from the space that you are inhabiting right now. Hence, even in this kind of paintings of a landscape like and also a townscape you can say a seashore with boats and with distant buildings, it is possible for a mimetic artist to go to the utmost details and create space. So, it is not just about the forms featuring in a painting, it is about the space that you are creating, it is also about the character of the space. Do you want the space in the painting appear as if it is an extension of the real space? Do you want to in other words create a sense of depth in your space? Then please follow certain principles of mimetic tradition. But if you want your painting to look like as if it is a separate world, separate from your own world in terms of space, then follow the non mimetic tradition where artists do not bother to apply the rules of perspective and all that. And that is how in mimetic traditions usually you get an incredible sense of space and in non mimetic traditions generally speaking you get a whole lot of possibilities to imagine, to exercise any amount of imagination because the space does not have a restricted notion with reference to the real space. It is a mental space, it is a conceptual space in non mimetic tradition whereas, in mimetic tradition like this it is an extended space. So, the body that you see human body with full flesh and volume and perspective is also an extension a tangible extension of the real human body. But interestingly in mimetic traditions what you finally create is not a real life of course, but an illusion of real life. Whereas, in non mimetic tradition nobody creates an illusion of real life because right at the outset you know when you are looking at a non mimetic art that you are looking at a different pictorial or a visual world. But when you are looking at a mimetic art you have this feeling that these figures, this space is almost look like an extension of your space, but the surface on which it has been painted is obviously flat either a flat wall or a flat canvas or a flat paper. So, literally speaking there is no extension of space, literally speaking there is no depth of space, what is created generally in mimetic tradition is an illusion of space, an illusion of three dimensionality, an illusion of surface texture and tactile feeling like this one. So, to achieve the best qualities of mimetic traditions the artists requires to hone the appropriate skills to depict the objects and figures in exact details like this one. You almost feel like that you can go and touch the robe, you can touch the drapery, you can touch the cloth, you can touch the skin and if you touch the skin you will get that kind of tactile feeling, but that is absolutely wrong. I mean you cannot do that it is a canvas painting, it is just an oil paint. So, using canvas as a surface and oil paint as your medium and using certain techniques of painting you create uh, a very convincing realism which uh, forms a very important part of mimetic art. Even in the era of modern art the mimetic tradition continues, but in new styles and new techniques and with more emphasis on the technical and expressive aspects 
and that is why when you look at a painting by Degas like the one on the left and you look at the painting by Van Gogh the painting on the right on this slide you know that yes the artists the painters are still uh, they still belong to that mimetic tradition but they are not really trying to create an illusionistic painting. They, given the kind of paintings they are doing, it is pretty obvious that they do not want to evoke this feeling that you are looking at almost the real world. Rather, they want to evoke this feeling that you are looking at a painted world. But until, I mean this was all uh, fine uh, so far until abstract art appears in modern western art and abstract art is clearly denied any chance of mimesis in their art. So, within the tradition of western art whereas on the one hand we do have mimetic traditions as it appears in roman art as it appears uh, renaissance art onwards in renaissance, high renaissance, baroque and all that in of course, realism, neoclassicism, then early modern art, there is also an element of mimesis, but in the 1940s and also uh, earlier to that, there are few artists who set on to create some artworks where there will be no chance, no element, no scope for any kind of mimesis. They were creating abstract art. Thank you.